Good morning to everyone, and uh, thank you for in, uh, for the invitation to actually be able to speak uh, among um, such distinguished colleagues and also researchers and 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 basically individuals who take a good care of uh, basically youth civic spaces per se. So um, it's nice to talk to academics as well as practitioners. And what I'll be doing today, I'll basically present something which we have done collaboratively um, with a, two other colleagues from, uh, well, uh, Mitya Sardoc from Educational Institute of Slovenia and Jason Laker from San Jose State University in California. And what we've done uh, was exactly what uh, you, Darko, already explained. We looked at this shrinking civic spaces phenomenon in the youth field, right? So basically this was our intention and we did it for the um, European Youth Forum. This was a uh, small study commissioned by the European Youth Forum. And you're able also to download it if you're interested in it. Uh, so basically, it got published uh, around uh, the, I think, uh, at the beginning of this year, even before the Corona period. Uh, if we, if it would be in the middle, we, we would have to revise it totally. No, no not really. But uh, anyway, <laughs> we would have done so. So um, anyway, uh, to be um, to to actually respect the time restrictions. I'll just go through these basic assumptions we actually had before um, entering the uh, the field uh, and examining the the, the, the situation uh, at the ground. So basically, what we started with was some clear um, assumptions that are visible everywhere. Basically, if you look at various uh, democracy indexes, whether be it Economist, Bertelsmann. Um, nation in transit, whatever, you can see it all over. So basically, we're experiencing a global phenomenon, phenomenon of reverse transitions. There's an authoritarian pushback against democracy, but it's not just that, you know, also the, the let's say, functioning or ad allegedly functioning democracies are experiencing problems in that respect. So basically, we were, everywhere aware of the, the phenomenon such as hate speech, fake news, populism, conflicting diversity. So it was clear that some bad things are uh, actually uh, going on and taking place regardless of, um, of, of the country we're looking into. Uh, then uh, there's also a clear silencing and persistent silencing of voices of civil society and also youth civil society all across Europe and the world. It's usually camouflaged under some sort of crises, right? So basically, whether it's financial or it's um, 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 uh, Islamic radicalization, or it's now it will be um, um, Corona and afterwards it, it will be post Corona. So it's always some sort of crisis. And then this is a good opportunity to silence the voices that actually depend primarily from some sort of either support or funding, uh, usually for governments, like uh, many um, in, in many countries. Of course, there are variations, but in many countries, especially where democracy is weaker, uh, civil society hugely depends on support from public funds. So basically, we're, we, we keep seeing that. Uh, and obviously, it's clear that it makes a good sense to actually look at civic spaces since they represent one of the most important social spheres of shared associational life, right? So basically, this is why we actually looked at it, because it's actually something that safeguards basic civil rights. And uh, obviously, it's one of the key safeguards against tyranny and oppression. And why we looked at the youth component of it, and primarily, um, let's say, youth sector organization, even though at, at, at that study we focused more on youth organizations that are youth-led. But anyway, uh, we took into account, we have in our um, sample uh, basically uh, also uh, youth centers, uh, uh, organizations that operate for youth and not just uh, our youth led or youth co-led. So basically, uh, we looked at that because 
youth specific issues are important for youth and for youth uh, for for youth problems and for addressing the issues which are specific obviously uh, and then they are important to for for um, basically bringing these key issues on the agenda as well as they function as brilliant laboratories of democracy so various social innovations take place there so it obviously makes a good sense to actually look at that and uh, see whether we're basically stripping ourselves of the opportunity of future innovation in that sense as well so uh, we took the basic definition of a civic space which actually focused on um, the ability to debate and exchange information, so freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom of peaceful assembly. And what we did with that, we actually um, constructed an instrument which was a uh, web-based self-administered survey, and it was distributed across 1,100, uh, we would say, the most important organizations across Europe. Uh, of course, this, is, this can be contested, but what we did was we looked at all umbrella organizations and their members and, 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 and umbrella organizations of umbrella organizations. So we are pretty sure that no uh, uh, key organization was missed. Uh, we received 322 valid responses and we modified this instrument in a way to actually address also a bit more the uh, um, organizational dynamics and specifics of these organizations. So what we looked at, we looked at five um, dimensions. F first was freedom of information and expression, then rights of assembly and association, then citizen participation, then non-discrimination and inclusion, and human rights and the rule of law from youth perspective. Uh, so if we look at the results, and then these are the results also published in the study, so you'll be able to look at uh, those results there. Uh, there was clearly, there were issues rega uh, regarding access to information. So obviously, like more than a third of organizations have tr had troubles accessing information. Then half of them at least had some fear of retribution from the government or funders as a result of um, expressing themselves. So there was a fear of, 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 of uh, free expression because they feared the, the, the funds will actually stop at some point because of their opinion and then uh, their voice. Uh, when we looked at the uh, freedom of expression uh, in particular, uh, the one fifth organ of, organization, of organizations experienced visible difficulties. And we can, during the QA session, we can talk about different difficulties because obviously they differ across country to country. In some cases, they're more subtle, in others, they're very direct. But anyway, it was clear that one fifth of, of organizations experienced that. Uh, one quarter in the EU 13, so basically new member states. Uh, almost half of, of organizations outside EU or, or EU or EEA area. So it was clear, clear that there are differences between different regions. And in various cases, we also looked at um, more uh, or more defined regions or areas, and obviously there were uh, grave cases there. But and anyway, also in the EU 15 and uh, EEA area, there was clearly a problem there as well. Then if we look at the right of assembly and association, and we basically like ask them, what about like public assemblies, participation in public assemblies, demonstrations, well, basically 15% of them actually experience difficulties. Uh, to some, 15% may, may not be big number or a lot, but, but we're talking about basic rights. You need, to take, uh, you, you need to take notice of that. So basically we're talking about basic rights that actually establish conditions for a functioning democracy. 
And actually, we, we, we talk about 15% of, organ, of organizations experience, experiencing these kinds of difficulties. More than 30%, so one third outside the EU EEA area. When we talk about the ability to function independently and free from government interference, 40% of organizations do not feel free or completely free from, for, from government interference. So basically have experienced some sort of interference um, from uh, public authorities. Then 50%, 15% of them experienced like difficulties that are actually very easy to, um, uh, to pick or to, to, to demonstrate. And when it comes to access to funding, we all know about Foreign Agents Act and, and Hungary and Macedonia. Everyone's aware of that. But we were not looking at that in particular. We were, but also other things. Because obviously, under this veil of indicators, there's always this neo, neoliberal discourse which actually strips organizations of their basic functions and actually tries to monitor them or actually uh, portrays them as a, some sort of market actors, even though they are not market actors and they should not be. And, and it was clear also from the previous um, presentation that they have a special function in, 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 in this societal setting. So basically one third of organizations experience problems with access to funding and they explain it due to so-called market indicators. And obviously there are provisions of um, I don't know, a necessity to demonstrate the ability to access private funds or uh, some sort of other very clear market-oriented um, conditions to access public funding and to perform these basic tasks that they're performing and which are not oriented into the market or not, are not market-oriented activities. So then uh, more than 10% of them had great uh, degree um, uh, of difficulties regardless of the region. So basically, it's not just Belarus, you know. W we should stop uh, kind of um, talking only about the usual suspects because it was clear it's, it's UK. UK was big there. Uh, so that there are also some Scandinavian countries. So obviously, there are some issues which are global and obviously all governments in a way try to get a grip of, let's say, uh, bad behaving civil society in order to actually um, have at least some sort of control over them. Uh, so um, more than a third of them experienced barriers to foreign funding. Obviously, the usual cases is in this case was clear, were clear and also the strategies there were totally different. Uh, but as I said, it's not just foreign funding and it's not just Soros, right? Um, so basically when we looked at the participation, so basically this citizen uh, participation, participation in decision-making processes. So how are they able to function as some sort of mediator of the interest of youth? More than a quarter of them experience difficulties in participation in processes of decision-making um, on issues important to them, so basically to youth. Um, more than a third in EU 13 and, e, uh, and countries outside EU. Uh, and when it, when it comes to collaboration with authorities, one-tenth of organizations reported their opinion sometimes or always is discouraged. So basically 10% of them are not uh, able to access any kind of consult consultation processes. One fifth of, of them in EU 13 countries. Um, so basically new member states. One, even though they're not so new anymore, right? Uh, one third of organizations reported their opinion is never encouraged. So basically, some in, in some cases there was clear discouragement, but in other areas there was lack of e encouragement. And if we know that youth is per se the most weakly represented population, because they have like there's 17% of the electorate, and usually in the parliaments you get 
from 0.5 to 2 percent of representatives. If you talk about young women, it's less than 0.5 percent. So basically, less than one percent um, of the electorate represented in in the uh, legislature. So basically, it's clear that also here, even though there should be clear governmental or public authority uh, encouragement of those voices, there was none. So even this is a problem, right? Um, especially when we talk about reforms that will for sure strip you, because obviously they have numerical weakness uh, when compared to other, um, other age groups or other parts of the electorate. So when we look at the invitation to participate, and this is also this encouragement, more than one fifth of organizations never experienced any kind of invitation. Uh, it's local level, but then if we talk about national level, it's uh, a bit lower, but still very visible. Uh, and also the EU level or transnational level, as we called it, because obviously there are also other relevant uh, uh, actors or organizations out there, uh, it's not much better, uh, to be to be frank. Uh, only one third of organizations are often invited. So basically, encouragement exists for one third. And uh, a county, in, 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 when interpreting this data, we also got responses for, from so-called gongos. Yeah? So you have to be sure that there, there, there is this deficiency in data there as well. And we know because, because we've seen data. Um, and then if you take into account also this, then obviously this encouragement is even lower. Uh, and obviously also percentages are, uh, as I said, similar to national level. Uh, if, even though a national level is a bit better when it comes to discouragement, um, as well as uh, EU or transnational level, which is a bit better, but not not really substantially. Uh, and it, when it comes to acknowledgement of the opinion, it's obviously clear that that the issues are here as well. So basically, half of the organizations believe youth organizations are rarely taken into account when when it comes to um, decision making and and outcomes of public pol of of um, uh, um, political um, decision making. Uh, only 5% of organizations believe it is always taken into account. And when it comes to the influence on the political outcomes, a quarter of them report uh, they're able to influence outcomes to a reasonable extent. Two thirds of them uh, that there are clear difficulties in influencing the outcome. So basically, Many times it's just a, a, a theater, right? A circus. So basically it's tokenism. They're there, but they, they know that they don't matter. And obviously this is, this is also a, a, a source of huge discouragement, um, especially if you take into account the organizational weaknesses from these kinds of organizations, which lack basically professionals, and then and, and, and also funding to actually do this persistent game. Um, so in a way, uh, when we also look at the uh, engagement in advocacy activities, uh, only 60% of organizations report the ability of full engagement. So basically 40% do not have the ability to fully engage in advocacy activities, even though they would like to. Yeah? 15% of them experience clear difficulties. And when it comes then to a broader category of, let's say, um, their perception, and these are the leaders of organizations, these are, these are not organizational members. They report, like their perception is, that young people's equal access to civic space is limited. So basically they believe, and one fifth of them believes, that young people have limited access, that they actually explain how, but I won't go into details. And uh, half of them um, believe that they are underrepresented. And obviously this is not just their hunch because we have loads of data uh, actually demonstrating this. When it comes to various subgroups, obviously young women, but especially I would point out to economically disadvantaged they perceive the economically disadvantaged 
as the most underrepresented and the ones that have the most limited access to the civic space, which actually also uh, makes, uh, makes sense. Uh, and when it comes to the freedom from political pressures, obviously there are big differences here. Uh, also, if you look at EU member states, particularly between uh, new and old, uh, 40% 40, 40 of organizations believe young people are only moderately free from pol political pressures. One-fifth of them believe they are free only to a limited extent. Uh, and now if I try to conclude something that actually, I guess, sounded all very quantitative or very descriptive, uh, obviously there are, there, there's a great deal of variety among countries, but one of the key things we actually witnessed is that there is a trend of shrinkage regardless of the wealth, democratic trans, uh, tradition, human rights record across countries. And this is important. And obviously also when it comes, because in, in some cases we also looked at like the, the ability to function online and so on. There was clear, uh, clearly a, a, a problem there when it comes to develop democracies and well, at least well-performing uh, democracies and, and countries. So obviously we cannot kind of discard this problem to a, let's say the usual suspects uh, we usually talk about when we actually try to demonstrate problems. Uh, what's also clear that, that there are various strategies and, and when it comes to, let's say more developed democracies, the strategies of governments are more subtle, sophisticated. When it comes to less, they're more blunt. Uh, and actually, you know, we experienced or we identified and we organizations also reported various cases where they said, look, it's one of the dimensions was for sure the changes in the legal status. Then obviously the funding, national or foreign. Then reporting requirements, basically uh, based on or additional requirements or conditions uh, to access funding or to function on the basis of market indicators. Various other bureaucratic obstacles combined with administrative regulation, be it accounting, whatever, which demands professional support. And this is what these organizations usually lack. Uh, and obviously also, and this is a, a, a case more in, 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 in some um, more uh, troubling uh, um, uh, areas, direct and indirect smearing campaigns to undermine reputation or question their mission. So basically, uh, I would could conclude with a thought. Yesterday, I've seen an interview um, um, uh, conducted by Christiane Amanpour and then she talked to Madeleine Albright and she said in her book also that uh, actually th there was a quote from Mussolini and he said basically if you defer a chicken slowly nobody will notice and my my conclusion here would be we're witnessing deferring everywhere across Europe and someone has to notice and I guess we're doing that, but obviously we're the ones barking, but the caravan goes on. So basically, I think the voice that we're making has to be, first of all, heard and has to be louder. Otherwise, we will basically um, end the debate or keep, deba keep debating in, 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 the, in this, I would say, still limited small bubble, whereas on the other side, the deferring will continue. Thank you.